I'm Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. Tell your story. Author, psychologist, musician. Listen to Dr. Karen to encourage your life. I'm all about taking charge, taking charge of your thoughts, taking charge of your life. I say it every week and how sometimes when we have intense emotions, we can get caught ruminating and obsessing. And we've looked at the research and how that actually doesn't help us at all. In fact, it keeps us stuck and it keeps us depressed rather than helping move us forward. Single is the new black. Don't wear white till it's right. Very important. Very important. What are they doing to keep that excitement and that in love love feeling? feeling? Channel a path to a more authentic you. Okay, this week, fight all you want, but whenever you fight, you have to hold hands. Learn how to have true intimacy. Yeah, bottle that up and sell it. (laughs) We want to make sure that the activities we're doing together are charging us up, getting us excited, giving us pleasurable feelings, and then helping us stay attracted to one another. Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. Love and life. I'm all about living authentically and finding the best version of you and living life to its fullest. Turn up your dial. Get connected. You're listening to Dr. Karen on Love and Life right now. Welcome to Dr. Karen Love and Life. I'm Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. On Love and Life, we cover it all. We look at how to have true intimacy in romantic relationships, more meaningful friendships, healthier family connections, more fulfilling careers, and we delve into what psych research teaches us about living happy, hopeful, positive, and authentic lives. On today's episode, I'm pleased to welcome John Berger to the program. John is an award-winning magazine writer and a contributor to Fortune magazine. A former senior writer at both Fortune and Money, John's work has also appeared in Barron's, Bloomberg Business Week, New York Magazine, Time, and The Washington Post. A familiar face and voice on television and radio, John has appeared on ABC's Good Morning America, BBC World Service, CNBC, CNN, MSNBC, National Public Radio, and Fox News, discussing a wide range of topics, from the dating market, to the stock market, to the oil market. A graduate of Brown University, John lives with his family in Larchmont, New York. John Berger, welcome to Love and Life. Karen, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate your time and thanks so much. So just to start things off, as I look at your bio, there's one element that's kind of not like the others. It seems like a bit of a leap to move from all this writing about money and economics and finance to writing a book on dating. What prompted you to write Datanomics? Yeah, that's typically the first question I get. Basically, how the heck did somebody who (laughs) normally writes about oil and gas or the stock market, how did I end up doing a book about dating? And the answer is pretty simple. So the the editorial staffs um, at Money and Fortune magazines were disproportionately women. And over my years there, I could not help but notice that most of the men were either married like myself or involved in long-term relationships, whereas the women, who I think I can objectively say had more going for them dating-wise, the, <laughs> the, the women were all disproportionately single, right. and they were unhappily single, and they all seemed to have these dating stories and dating histories that made no sense to me. And so basically, I couldn't figure out why dating seemed so much harder for women than a did for men. Exactly. And I think that's something that if you've spent some time in the jungle that is the dating scene, many women lament that there seems to be this struggle. And so I think it's really fascinating that you tried to take then what you knew about economics and apply it to the dating realm. Were you just sitting around one day and just going, you know what, I think there might be some way to analyze this from a different vantage point. Well, I mean, I knew just from my own circle of friends that particularly after I hit 30, and when my wife and I were younger, we used to occasionally try to play matchmaker with our friends. But, but once I hit 30, I didn't know any more single men. Or if I did know single men, they just weren't like on the same level with all the single women we knew. So, I, I mean, I was aware that in my own circle of friends, there was this imbalance between 
the number of single women and the paucity of, of single men. But I have to admit, initially, my thought was this was just a big city phenomenon, that there was something about the maybe the job markets in big cities like New York or L.A. or London or Toronto, something about these cities that was drawing disproportionate numbers of women. But once I dug into the census data, I discovered this is not just a big city uh, phenomenon. The numbers are just as bad in Mississippi as they are in New York City. Right. Well, I came across your book um, last fall, and initially I really didn't know what to make of it. But what I will tell you is that pretty quickly you were convincing me. You do a very nice job. You bring so much research and so many numbers to to the picture that it's really hard to disagree with what you found. And it was really fascinating on one hand and then somewhat troubling on the other hand because it seemed to be a little bit scary in a way. And frankly, it's starting in the college scene because of what you have found, which was it in the mid 80s when the ratio of men to women in colleges became where it's lopsided and skewed to such that there are more women than men graduating college and at college. Yeah, the last year that more uh, men than women graduated from college, I think, was 1981. Okay. And in every year since, it's become incrementally more women than men graduating. And in the 80s, probably didn't notice it uh, because it was maybe 3 or 4% more women than men. In the early 90s, you, you didn't feel it in the same way. But, but since the year 2000, it's been four women graduating from college for every three men. And that kind of translates. You look at college grad millennials, um, people age 22 to 29 in the U.S., there's about 5.5 million women versus about 4 million men. And that's a, that's a big deficit. That's a big gap. At the same time, women have been outpacing men in education. There's been this trend throughout society of what academics refer to as assortative mating, which is just a fancy way of saying that college grads seem to only want to date and marry other college grads. Back to your point before about it being scary or depressing. I mean, I, I, I like to take a little more optimistic, glass half full, <laughs> uh, you know, look at it because I, I mean, a lot of the women who've read the book knew something weird was going on and they had moms or married friends who kept giving them all sorts of useless advice about all they were right. doing wrong. And I think I think for them, um, reading this was kind of a relief. And, and exactly. And I, I think it absolutely should be that because it does kind of explain, hey, it's not you. And like you're saying, they will hear this advice from their mother who was in college in 1967. And yeah. It's not the same landscape. It's so different. They so, mean yeah. well, right? <laughs> yeah, of course they do. Of course they do. But right, but they're just, it's, it's that different that they really can't compare their experience to their daughters. But interestingly enough, like getting back to the university scene, right after I read your book, I was asked to speak at a university in the Midwest to a group of women and I asked them, well, what do you want me to talk about? You know, I can talk about this, that, the other. And they said, the hookup culture. And I was like, oh, my gosh, do I have the source? I know exactly what I'm going to talk about based on so much of what you found. And so I was very enthusiastic. Here I come. I'm going to, Like you're saying, I'm going to explain to you, ladies, why this hookup culture is so rampant and why it's so prevalent and so frustrating for you. But what I found when I gave the talk I thought they would be, like you're saying, kind of relieved, like, ooh, okay, this explains it. But some of the women, there was some pushback. And I heard things like, well, you know, no, it, that's just how things are nowadays. It's different than it used to be. And women have sex like men, and it's no big deal, and we're fine. And I thought, mm, I don't know that you're fine, because A, the topic you wanted me to present on was the hookup culture, as in, like, how can we handle it, because we're not happy. And then B, some of the research you found was showing that women are not necessarily fine at all. You, you cite a, a study out of Loyola Marymount University that looks at the reality that college women are twice as likely as college men to experience psychological distress after hookups. And I'm just curious, when you are talking and when you're presenting your, your conclusions from all the research you've done, do you get some resistance as well? And what do you make of that? 
Well, the, the, the argument that I resist and I push back at the most is, is kind of what you just said. That anybody who says to me, well, things are just different nowadays. I mean, my follow-up question is why? Because it wouldn't have written this book if I actually believed things change for no reason. And I do not believe that things change for no reason. And if you look at, at, the, at the last two... The, the previous two sexual revolutions in the U.S., the 1920s, the flapper generation, and then the 1960s, um, you, you can, at the core of both of them was a gender ratio imbalance. They were different, and there were different causes. But historically, when there's been a gender ratio imbalances, the dating culture changes. But, but, I, I, but I, at the same time, I'm sympathetic with these college kids because I do not believe that young people are sitting around a room and doing a head count and saying, well, there's one, two, three, four of me and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them. So now I'm going to behave differently because I know the numbers are different. I mean, I, I, I think it's much more subconscious. And that's what the, what the scientific research shows. It basically indicates that this isn't just a numbers game that that um, people's behavior changes when uh, and people's mating strategies change when sex ratios are lopsided. So I, I kind of feel that a college campus that's say 60% female, 40% male, three women for every two men, it, it's kind of a when in Rome phenomenon. Like when in Rome do as the Romans. People kind of everyone, men and women, buy into a looser, less monogamous dating culture. And I, I go back and forth on whether um, the men are pushing it, like are, are kind of leading the way, or whether everybody, um, you know, accepts it. And I, I think I lean towards the latter, just because kind of like you, I've had so many women, young women, tell me that they're perfectly okay with the hookup culture and it suits their lifestyle and who am I to judge? And I, I, I guess I kind of agree with that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not telling people that they have to get married. Hi, this is Damia Jackson. I am an avid listener of Dr. Karen's Love and Life podcast. It empowers, educates, and informs me to make better decisions in my life. I am happy that this resource is available to me. Another point that really came to mind was just a few months ago, actually, in June, I ended up spending some time with a young man, a college senior, I'll call him Bobby, and he's a friend of my stepson, and Bobby and my stepson were spending a summer term abroad. They were in Spain. And the interesting thing was that when Bobby found out what I do, he wanted to ask me some questions. It was really funny. So I'm going to kind of sum up what Bobby had to say because I think you'll find it interesting too. So this is to quote, I don't really have any interest in dating anyone exclusively, but when I hang out with a girl and we end up hooking up, she gets all attached, even when I've been very upfront with her that I'm not interested in a relationship. I don't understand how I'm considered the bad guy when I've been honest from the beginning, but these women get all possessive and mad at me, and it gets to the point that I've had girls say to me, you don't even like me that much, and I'll say, no, I don't, <laughs> but then they'll still sleep with me, and he's like asking me then at this point, what do you think? Am I a big fat jerk and I don't even know it? And I just looked at him and I thought, oh my gosh, this is like the voice of what John Berger was saying in his book. And it's just another little fact, uh, he was one of just five out of the group of 30 from the university. He was just one of five men. <laughs> see, I, see, I think it would be interesting if you put Bobby in a situation in which he was one of uh, 25 men and mm -hmm. women. Um, and he connected one of the women, whether he would be more possessive and more right. um, more interested in having an exclusive relationship. And, and honestly, I, I think if, if the numbers were reversed in that way, I'm sure we would be seeing kind of different kinds of bad behavior from women. Like, it, you know, it, it may not be exactly what we're seeing now, but I'm sure there would be men who would be frustrated by the behavior of women because the women had so many choices and uh, were being extra choosy and maybe maybe leading some men on while they figured out whether whether their choice was actually up to snuff or not. You know, like from Bobby's perspective, he just thinks he's special, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't, he's not looking at this from a market perspective and he doesn't understand um, how much more 
leverage he has, given that he's one of five guys in a group of 30 young people. Well, yeah, and it's funny because he is really charming and, and he's, yeah, he's a great guy, certainly. And I'm not sure how aware of of his specialness, that part of that may be due to the numbers game that he has just been very lucky <laughs> to step into this sort of lopsided ratio. Honestly, and to, to just to let listeners know, I told Bobby, no, you're not a jerk. I mean, you're being honest. If women choose to, when you say to their face, I don't like you that much, but sure, I'll sleep with you. If they then go and choose to sleep with you, that's, they have to own their part in this dance and this experience. And so... Yeah, I mean, I mean if you want to see the uh, reverse, I mean, go to a place like Caltech, right. California Institute of Technology in Pasadena, California. I mean, Caltech is about, I think, 60% male, 40% female, which means three men for every two women. And I did a focus group there and it's the absolute opposite. I mean, the, if people get together, it's always in the context of relationship, you know, and one, one girl told me that her freshman, you know, residential advisor, um, urged her not to rush into getting her first boyfriend because she told her you'll probably end up marrying him. Right. Um, and and yeah. actually, when I was at Caltech, it was not long after Valentine's Day. And on a lark, I asked these kids, well, what's a Valentine's Day like at Caltech? And this one young man immediately piped up and he said, oh, my, our dorm, Lloyd House, we have this big Valentine's Day tradition. And I was like, oh, well, what is it? He said, well, all the uh, all the guys, we make handcrafted Valentines for the girls, and then we wake up early on Valentine's Day morning to cook them pancakes. <laughs> it, you know, and I, I laugh, and it's adorable, and it's cute, but I guarantee you, at a school that's 60% female, like NYU or UNC Chapel Hill, that is not happening. Yeah, I remember that from the book, and I was astounded. And I thought it was fascinating as well how you said MIT, which should be analogous to Caltech, but it's not based on the fact that MIT has so many other colleges around it that it ends up being absorbed by that college dating scene. And then the numbers get skewed again. So, so MIT is interesting. I, I don't know if you've been to Boston or, you know, you know, that area where MIT is located, but basically it's, it's right next door to Boston University, which is, I believe, 60 two percent female which is again three women for every two men and then also wellesley college which is an all women's college um they a lot of wellesley women take classes at mit so it's it's not exactly analogous to to caltech because while caltech is more of a closed dating environment um the, you know, mit is part of kind of a, I guess you might call it a, a broader dating ecosystem. How about that? I like that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Michelle from Valparaiso, Indiana, and I listen to Dr. Karen Love and Life. So on to another topic that you bring up in the book, and I'm going to quote you. You ask, are women putting dating and marriage on the back burner simply because they enjoy casual sex and because they feel less burdened by sexual stigma than previous generations of women? Or alternatively, has the man deficit discouraged college educated women from putting too high a priority on love and romance because love and romance are harder to come by? And I think that women do receive mixed messages. We are certainly encouraged when we're younger to focus on our careers and be independent and get our education, some advanced degrees, and don't worry so much about marriage. But then throughout our early adulthood, I've found and I'd be curious what you thought about this, that we're still judged by our relationships primarily. We're valued by these relationships, which initially we're encouraged to focus on other things. And then later, if we don't have that relationship, then we're kind of uh, made to feel less than oftentimes. And so just curious if you had any thoughts on that. Well, I mean, I agree with everything you said, although I would add that, that I think it'd be surprised um, when, for men, like how often our mothers or grandmothers will ask us, so are you <laughs> dating a nice girl? I mean, like th th this does happen to men and people, yeah. you know, particularly your relatives, your mom, your grandmother wants to make sure that you're, you know, that you're pointing in the direction of marriage. Now, I, I'm yeah. sure this is more of an issue with women, but, but I just wanted to 
throw that out there. I think it's it's harder because I understand, given given the market conditions, so to speak, um, why a woman who has everything going for her and wants to get married would still be single at 32 or 35 or 40. But those of us like me, or at least before I wrote this book, me, who got married young, or this these women's married friends, parents, aunts, uncles, etc., they don't understand that they don't understand how tough it is out there and the there's this notion out there that these women must be doing something wrong i mean also if you go into barnes and noble and look at the like the the relationship books i mean there's like 30 dating books for women you know oh, your yeah. typical barnes and noble and there's maybe oh, yeah two or three for men and they aren't really dating books they're about pickup artistry and things like that <laughs> so th there's this like underlying message that men must be really good at dating because they don't need any help and women <laughs> must be bad at dating because there are all these books out there that tell them like everything they're doing wrong Oh um, gosh, and yeah. and I, I kind of feel like like this is a little bit what you're talking about, right? That there's all this mm -hmm. kind of pressure on, on single women to explain why, why they're single. And I, in some ways, I kind of hope my book helps women explain to people, look at stuff out there. It's not that I don't know what I'm doing. Yes, and, and I totally agree. In fact, I was at a wedding this weekend and speaking to a young woman who's 24 years old and doing graduate studies and she's living in Manhattan and she came up to me and she's like, she hadn't met me yet, but she'd heard about me. And so she came up to me and she said, I'm so glad to meet you. She's like, I don't get it. I'm like killing it in every area of my life except love. <laughs> and I said, you know what? Sit tight. I'm interviewing <laughs> an author who's going to really help you feel better about this whole situation. <laughs> it's really not your fault. So, yeah, I, I do. I, I do believe from, again, having read it and, and sharing it with other people. I do believe that you are, are providing that encouragement. It's not you. I think you said that in your on your website. It's not you. There's yeah. just too many of you or something like that. It's not you. It's the ratio. Which okay. Is what, basically, I, I interviewed... Um, some students at Sarah Lawrence College in, in New York State, and Sarah Lawrence, as a formerly all-women's college, is, is, is still very lopsided. I think it's 70% female, and um, it was like the most extreme example. And, and this one young woman told me that every time her her roommate seemed to have a, a meltdown with a boy, like her message was, it's not you, it's the ratio. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's helpful. It really is. <laughs> Hi, I'm Miriam Connor, and I listen to Dr. Karen Love and Life in Cleveland, Ohio. Another uh, topic I wanted to address with you and ask you about is kind of the question of, again, if someone would read this book and go, oh my gosh, I'm 35, I should have just married that really nice guy when I was 23 <laughs> that I, <laughs> I kind of liked, but I just wasn't sure. And I mean, someone could walk away from your book going, okay, I just better hurry up and get married young. And the quote from the book that I'll, I'll mention is, you know, the good men really are taken. They married young to women whose most salient characteristic was not their beauty or passion or int intellect, but their decisiveness. In terms of my argument, about marrying young. I mean, I, I'm not telling anybody that they have to get married at all. Um, I'm just kind of trying to make sense of the landscape. And my, my argument with this, like, I, I don't know if this comes up in your conversations with women, but, but I, I interviewed a bunch of women who told me that their life plan was something like this, that they were going to focus on career or grad school in their third in their 20s and then once they hit 30 they would get serious about dating and finding a husband etc um and there's nothing wrong with that that life plan but the problem is that the dating math gets worse for whichever gender is an oversupply in this case the women the longer you hold out and i i i, I like to compare this to the game musical chairs karen i assume you and most of your listeners played musical chairs at some point right right you know the game okay so as you may recall in the first round of musical chairs when there's like 25 players and 24 chairs only the slow poke does not get the chair right you kind of have to be chasing butterflies not to get a chair in the first round of musical chairs 
By the last round, however, you have a 50% chance of losing the game. In other words, the longer you stay in the game, um, each successive round, your odds of losing increase. And I kind of feel like something, there's a similar mathematical phenomenon happening with dating. So if you start out as millennials are with a dating pool that has 40 women and 30 men, which is essentially the ratio that um, among, uh, among young college grads, um, once half of the women marry, once 20 of the women marry 20 of the men, um, the remaining dating pool for singles becomes 20 women and 10 men. Once five more marry, it becomes 15 women and five men. So, 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 so holding out just mathematically, and this has nothing to do with looks or anything like that, just mathematically, it becomes more challenging the longer you hold out. Um, but that said, the, 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 these numbers only matter if you're, if you're gung-ho and intent on marrying somebody who went to college. The dating math is completely reversed in the non-college dating pool where it's the guys who have the trouble. One other point that I honestly found a little hard to stomach, although I will admit you made a very compelling argument, is that a woman may want to consider if she's been dating someone for a period of time and he doesn't seem to be uh, in any rush to walk her down the aisle, that a woman may want to lay down an ultimatum. And I'd like you to explain to listeners why you say this, because really that doesn't sound like the most sexy way to get proposed to. Probably not the most sexy way to get proposed to it. And every time I, I suggest this to women, the the answer, the response is kind of similar to what you just expressed. They, you know, they say, well, I really want my guy to come around on his own yeah. um, and to realize like for lightning to strike and realize, well, like I'm the one. <laughs> and um, maybe if I were more of a romantic and don't tell my wife that said, but <laughs> maybe if I were more of a romantic, I would buy into that kind of thing. But the, the, you know, when I was, when I was a, a younger man, my dad used to have this advice for me. It had nothing to do with dating. It was just kind of general life advice. And he would tell me, never make a decision before you have to. And it, in the context of like career or bending, like buying a home, like, like in, in, in every politics, like it, it, that's actually really good advice. But, and I kind of think guys are like, it, this is the kind of thinking that guys may be engaged in. Like, well, why should I make a final decision on my live-in girlfriend or my, my girlfriend of five years when I could continue to survey the field and see what else is out there? Um, and I just interviewed too many women who'd been like with the same guy for five years waiting for him to propose. And I kept asking them, well, what are you going to learn in year six that you didn't know about him in year five? And obviously the answer is nothing. And then if you issue a marriage ultimatum and you say, look, um, this is what I want. If this is not what you want, I, I, I don't think we should stay together. Th there are two outcomes here. One, you get married. Two, you don't waste another year with a guy who can't commit. Yeah. I mean, when, yeah, when I put on my, my uh, very analytical and this just makes sense hat, yes, it does. And then, of course, my hopeless romantic hat goes like those women that you've interviewed like I don't want to tell the story to my grandkids and then I convinced granddad to marry me because I told him either marry me or well, I'm well, gone well, do, do you want a, a really a really offbeat suggestion sure this? yeah I, I, I I've been telling women they should propose to him interesting uh, yeah there, there was a study out of the UK which found that men who were proposed to said yes in the same percentages as women who were proposed to wow this doesn't surprise me at all because the little secret about men, or not a secret, but something that I think women underappreciate is that men like women who like them. <laughs> it sounds simple, but, but I think women have too many girlfriends out there telling them, oh, you don't want to come on too strong. He'll think you're desperate, yada, yada, yada. Right. Guys like women who like them. So a woman who like lays it all on the line and announces that she wants to spend her life with you, 
uh, I think that's a, just as appealing to a guy as it is to a woman. Yeah. Well. And 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 then and then best of all, you know, he doesn't end up picking out some pear-shaped diamond ring that he didn't want. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can go to the jewelry store yourself and then get the round, brilliant one or whatever it is that that. Uh, right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dina, and I listen to Dr. Karen Love and Life in Chicago. On that note, let's leave listeners with some suggestions for solving the man deficit. And number one, you say make gender ratios a consideration when choosing a college. And it's interesting because one of the main responses I had from reading your book, I looked at my husband and I said, if we had a daughter, the first bit of information I would want when we were looking for a college for her would be the gender ratio. So you made an impact on me for sure. And the second thing that I was, again, looking into your book, um, I was really happy to see that Tufts, which is where my stepdaughter went, was actually one of the, the ratios are more, the ratio is more even. And I will say from her experience, and this was just a couple of years ago, because she's just a recent grad, that she had an, a boyfriend and the culture was that she dated this guy for two years. And that was completely normal within Tufts. And so it's still out there if someone is interested in having more of that kind of traditional, I'm going to have a boyfriend for a couple of years and see how that goes and then maybe break up, break up with him and have another boyfriend, that there are still college environments where that can be found. So yeah, I was fun- glad that you brought that up. A yeah, funny story. Both my niece and my nephew who are now um, in their late 20s, uh, both of them graduated from Tufts. And when I first kind of conceived of the idea for the book I was talking with them about this and and you know the the whole concept of the hookup culture was kind of foreign to them and they knew it kind of existed among uh, you know uh, other colleges but they they were a little bit skeptical about the idea of the book and then I checked out Tufts you know gender ratio and aha it's 50 50 so so Mm -hmm. yes I'm not surprised the culture is different at Tufts right and just confirmed the, your your yeah. thesis. Yeah, basically any college like Tufts that has a large engineering program is mm-hmm. going to be more gender balanced. Obviously, not everybody goes to college to get a boyfriend or girlfriend. Right. <laughs> and, and, and dating is, is, for some people, they have no interest in dating. Some people, not everybody is heterosexual. So I, I don't yes. want the message to be that John Berger is telling everybody to pick a college based on the <laughs> sex ratio. I know, but I think I am. Okay, so, that's I, fine. <laughs> but, um, no. So, number two, you uh, your suggestion is, hey, just be aware that holding out is a risky marriage strategy for college educated women, and and uh, you've talked about the musical chairs analogy, and. Uh, I, I got a, a chuckle out of one of the quotes you put in. You said, "As my married neighbor sometimes advises her own never married friends, just wait for the second round." I'm not advising that, but but, <laughs> but, but but if you look at the census data for say um, the baby boomer generation, um, there's about um, I think about forty percent more. Uh, college grad baby boomer women who are divorced but not remarried than there are similar men who are divorced but not remarried. So so clearly the you know the 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 men who've divorced um, have had an easier time remarrying. Mm-hmm. The third suggestion is your workplace is part of your dating ecology, so choose your career judiciously. Can you give us a little bit more on that one? Yeah, th- this one also comes with similar caveats. Obviously, if you're um, a very happy, successful school teacher, um, but your dating life isn't so good, I'm not suggesting that you that you go and become an aircraft mechanic just because the sex <laughs> ratio is is better right. in that in that field. Um, and honestly, the, 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 this this advice really isn't all that helpful for somebody who's 40 years old. But obviously, somebody is not going to to change their whole career just be, you know for dating purposes. But um, if I guess if dating is not your strong suit, um, and and you put a very high priority on marriage, and I know not everybody does. Um, yeah, like they're you know if you're if you're science oriented. Um, uh, engineering, you know, has has a lot more men than say medicine does. So it's something, you know, I, again, I, I this is just something to. This is one of many factors to consider. I certainly wouldn't um, advise anybody to pick a career based on sex ratios. But like you say, it's something to consider. It's interesting because I spent uh, last weekend at this wedding I was mentioning. 
um, one of the women who was there that I just met for the first time, her husband's a professor at Caltech. So right away I was like, oh, I have an interesting <laughs> bit of information on Caltech. And she confirmed everything you've said, but she also then broke it down. She said biology actually has more women than say chemistry or physics. So it's interesting, even within science as a, an overarching umbrella discipline, then they're the subdisciplines. If you want to get really strategic, ladies, and I'm not saying, and certainly John Berger is not telling you to get that strategic, <laughs> but I might advise you still <laughs> to consider exactly which discipline you want to be a part of based on the numbers. But number four, go west, young woman. And this one, again, makes me laugh because even though I've mentioned that when I was giving this talk based on your research, I there was some pushback from some of the women, but some of the women were really on board. And one of the questions at the end when I was taking questions from the audience, this one woman raised her hand. She said, now, where am I moving after grad again? <laughs> where are all these men? <laughs> so where are they moving, John? Well, far and away, the, the best dating market in the country uh, for women is Silicon Valley. Um you know, the, or San Jose, uh, the, you know, the, and it's no, no secret why. I mean, the, uh, all these computer companies, tech companies, um, they employ a lot of computer scientists and engineers, and those fields are disproportionately male. So as a result, Santa Clara County, which is where San Jose is and where Google and Apple and all these companies are based, um, Santa Clara County is really the only um, well-populated part of the country where college, young college grad men outnumber young college grad women by, by a really wide margin. So if I were to suggest one place to move, that would be it. Now, I'm sure, you, you know, you might get pushback from women who hear about this, you know, this controversy at Google that, that, that has, you know, come up in recent days and weeks about the, you know, the, um, you know, the bro culture there and this kind of this this sexist engineer who is pushing back against uh, uh, gender diversity initiatives. Um, I, I guess what I would say is that while working with some of these guys might not be pleasant, they they might be better as boyfriends or <laughs> or husbands. Um, because if you actually if you look at the at the data for Santa Clara County, which again is a pretty good proxy for, you know, for the Bay, you know, for Silicon Valley, the the marriage rate for college grad women is off the charts high, and the divorce rate is basically through the floor low, which tells me that when met, when women are in shorter supply, the men behave behave differently, behave better. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Number five. Your final recommendation is college educated women should consider expanding their dating pool to include lesser educated men. Yeah, th this may be five on the list, but to me, this is the most important one. Um, now, obviously, everything we've talked about wouldn't matter so much if everybody was more open minded about whom we date and marry. But mm -hmm. as I said, the reality is that there's been this 50 year trend towards college grads. Uh, only really wanting to date and marry other college grads. So we now have two, not totally separate, but, but somewhat separate dating pools. We have a blue collar dating pool that has too many men and not enough women, mm -hmm. and a white collar dating pool, a college grad dating pool that has too many women and not enough men. We just never hear about the shortage of women in the blue collar dating pool because working class guys do not write novels or screenplays or Huffington Post articles about their dating woes. But trust me, you know, this is out there. I mean, not long after the book came out, I got a very angry Twitter message from a guy who, um, you know, I'm going to censor what he said, but basically he said, why doesn't anybody talk about us? And I told hmm. him he hadn't read the book. He just read a review. And I said, look, um, I actually do talk about you, about you guys in the book, but mm -hmm. guys don't really buy dating books, so it's really only <laughs> ten pages of a two hundred and you know forty page book. But but right. I acknowledge that this is a real issue, um, but there just isn't the same level of sympathy for these for these guys. Um, but I guess the the bigger point here is I kind of feel it's inevitable that um, that that some of these 
you know, non-college guys will find their way to the college-educated women and vice versa. And I actually think a lot of these, these guys are probably more commitment-minded than, you know, the, 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 the young dudes who, you know, uh, work as lawyers or investment bankers on Wall Street uh, because the cops and the firemen and the electricians and the plumbers, um, that they are in a dating environment in which women are scarce, so they probably treat them better. So, so, th so th this is really my, my biggest piece of advice to everybody to become more open-minded about dating. And I love that because, and I always encourage the women I talk to and the men I talk to, really, it's about values. It's about, do your values align? Do you want the same things from life? And I understand a woman who that's been her social scene. So that's what she's used to. But to your point, there could be so many hard work. Like if you, if you were looking for someone who's driven and hardworking, you may find that way more plentiful in your, like you're saying, blue collar population than some of these silver spoon kids who, <laughs> you know, got a legacy into a nice school and got a job and a cushy job, you know, from their, you know, from their father in the firm those values that you think are represented by this college degree may not be there. And so they may be very, very apparent in, in some of the, the hardworking individuals that are, you just haven't crossed their path because it's not been part of your world. Yeah, no, and I, I, I understand the resistance and I'm not saying that it's only women who are too picky. I mean, I mean, it, it, college grad guys don't want to date non-college grad women either it's just that it's just that choosiness doesn't penalize the guys it only penalizes the women because there's a you know there's a shortage of college grad uh, men so i i just want to make it clear i'm not i'm not like i'm not saying oh you you know uh, women are closed-minded and men are not i mean everybody is it's just the there's more of an incentive for women to um to expand their dating pool. And perhaps if they do expand their dating pool and they're willing to date the, you know, the plumber or the fireman, um, maybe that'll take away some of the leverage from the educated guys. Mm -hmm. And maybe those guys will behave a little better too. <laughs> I love it. John Berger, thank you so very much for joining me on the program today. And where can listeners get more information and follow you on social media? Thanks for having me on. You can follow me uh, on Twitter at uh, John Berger One. It's spelled kind of funny, J-O-N-B-I-R-G-E-R, -E the number one. Um, my website is datanomics.com. I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook. You can follow me there. And if you want to buy the book, probably Amazon is the, the easiest place to, to buy it. But, you know, Barnes & Noble has it as well. But Feel free to buy it on Amazon or any or any any local or online book vendors. Great. Thanks again. You're welcome. So the love and life hack for this episode is it's not you. It's the ratio. You can find me at my website, www.drkaren.me, and that's Karen with an I. On Twitter, I'm at Dr. Karen Anderson. Facebook, Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. Instagram, I'm at Dr. Karen. And I'd love to hear from you. You can email me your story or ask me a question at karen at drkaren.me. Thank you so much for subscribing and liking the podcast on iTunes and SoundCloud. We're also on Stitcher and Spreaker at Dr. Karen Love and Life. If you head over to my website, please sign up for my Love and Life newsletter. I send out one or two emails a month, just letting you know what we're covering on the podcast, what I'm blogging about, and any appearances I might be making. Please let me know if you have any topics you want me to cover. I want this to be your show as much as it is mine. Thanks to my producer, Michelle Musso, and my communications manager, Dale Gregory. Take charge of your thoughts. Take charge of your life. This is Dr. Karen Anderson Abril. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, make it a great week. <laughs>